Good afternoon. My name is Christopher Geisler. I'm the director of the John Hay Library and Special Collections, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the library and to the 2017 Mel and Cindy Yokin Cultural Series Lecture, sponsored by the Brown University Friends of the Library. I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Mel Yokin, who will introduce our distinguished speaker this evening. Uh, this lecture is made possible by a man well known to many of you, I suspect quite a few of you. Uh, for over 40 years, Professor Yokin, an alumnus of the university, has collected correspondence and literary works by American, British, French, and Quebecois authors, as well as artists, educators, and other public figures, a selection of which is on display, curated by Professor Yokin, and I hope you'll have a chance to look at it after the lecture. Through his enthusiasm and dedication, Professor Yokin has created an extraordinary collection at the John Hay, one that supports a broad range of teaching and learning interests. So I don't think it's been uh, diagnosed in the DSM, but collecting uh, is uh, certainly can be identified as a mania, and uh, many would suggest it's a disease. But uh, it can also be a gift, a very rare gift, and I think that uh, this is what we can see in Professor Yokin's collection. Um, uh, the collection that he built here is a it identifies both a commitment to scholarship and teaching. For more than 50 years, Professor Yokin has taught French to students at UMass Dartmouth, and he's currently the Chancellor Professor Emeritus of French Language and Literature and the Director of the Boivin Center for French Language and Culture. Uh, I'm, I'll be careful with my French. Uh, <laughs> Professor Yokin has advised that he will uh, help me over the coming years, so maybe next year I'll do a better job. When not teaching or collecting, Professor Yokin has published and lectured internationally and on French, internationally on French and Quebecois culture through the lens of 19th and 20th century literature and theater. Professor Yokin received numerous awards, including com commendations from the Acad Academy Francaise and the French government. Professor Yerkin has received the Robert Ludwig National Distinguished Leadership Award in Foreign Languages from the New York State Foreign Language Association, and most recently, the Distinguished <coughs> Alumnus Award from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, we have Professor Yerkin with us here today, uh, and uh, please welcome him. Thank you, Christopher, for such a nice introduction. And thank you to Tout Mon Curly for what you've done here as director of the John Hay Library and Special Collections. Cindy and I are delighted to welcome all of you here today for the annual Yoken Lecture. And we're thrilled to see such a large and enthusiastic audience for what will be, we're certain, a top-notch and memorable lecture. Anka Malstein, born in Paris, is a celebrated and highly acclaimed author. She has published biographies such as those of Catherine de Medici, Marie de Medici, James de Rothschild, and Astolphe de Custine. She has published other works such as Monsieur Proust's Library and Balzac's Omelette. She has won prizes from the Académie Française and was the laureate of the Goncourt Prize for Biography. Extremely, and I emphasize that, extremely prestigious literary honors. This evening, Madame Malstein will concentrate on her latest book, The Pen and the Brush, which will be on sale after the lecture. And of course, she'd be more than willing to sign your copy during at the reception. Once again, the reception is afterward, book signing afterward downstairs. Cindy and I are truly honored to have such a respected and highly acclaimed author with us this evening. Therefore, mesdames, messieurs, j'ai le plus grand plaisir de vous présenter mon ami, Madame Anka Malstein. Thank you, Mel. <laughs> I'm very pleased uh, to be here at Brown. Actually, I have a very personal connection with Brown. Not only my son-in-law is a professor here, but my, gra my granddaughter graduated from Brown. And she got an excellent education <laughs> and went up to have a teaching career of her own in New York. 
Um, so I'll start speaking about a different to topic. <laughs> I'm often asked what uh, gave me uh, the idea of writing about the influence of painting on novels, in fr on French novels uh, in the 19th century. I was preparing a talk on a literary society at the time of Renoir for the Frick Museum. And I thought immediately of Proust, because Proust once wrote that as soon as Renoir was recognized for the great painter he was, all the pretty girls in, pa in Paris started looking like Renoir. <laughs> so actually, the painter had literally changed the way reality was perceived. Now, much as I love Proust, I did realize that I had to enlarge a bit the subject. So I started reading up the century, to, so to speak. And I, much to my surprise, I realized that every French novelist of the time either wrote about painting or created characters that were painters, that painting was uh, the real central preoccupation of writers at that time. And what puzzled me was that this was not true of other literatures. Uh, well, for instance, uh, the great Russians, you have no painters in Tolstoy or in Dostoevsky. In England, uh, no painters in Dickens, no painters in Trollope. In Middlemarch, you have a very secondary character who is a painter. You have to wait till Virginia Woolf, really, at the beginning of the 20th century for painting to be discussed in English literature. And uh, the same is true of American literature. You have to wait for Henry James. So how does one explain this? And this question really obsessed me until it dawned upon me that the explanation must have been that the first public museum in Europe opened in France at the end of the 18th century. It was going to be known as the Louvre. Actually, it opened in 1793 during the most violent year of the French Revolution. The king had been executed in January. The Louvre, the actual building, the palace, had been a royal residence for <coughs> centuries and centuries. And it was turned into a museum. And a museum that could boast of an a huge collection because it consisted mainly of all the royal collections plus whatever the revolutionary uh, government had confiscated from the church or from the emigres that had fled France. So it opened with great uh, fanfare. And the works were not uh, were, uh, ex exhibited in a very didactic way. Uh, they were shown by school, uh, chronological order. Uh, there was a booklet that was distributed to the visitors explaining the different paintings. Now, very soon, the collections who were important to begin with grew exponentially with uh, the victories, uh, the conquest, really, of the French revolutionary armies and later of uh, Napoleon's uh, conquests. Because every victory translated in systematic pillaging of works of art in conquered territories. Now, of course, the looting of art uh, predates uh, Napoleon. But the importance, quality, and sheer number of art that was brought into France really uh, defies imagination. Uh, you know, you had convoys laden with Rembrandts, Van Eyck's, Rubens's that were brought to Paris after the fall of Brussels in 1794. Uh, then uh, more Flemish art uh, arrived after the fall of Anvers or Ghent. Uh, the same thing happened in Germany. In Italy, it took even bigger proportions because uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, who was not yet emperor, had been named a general of the army of Italy. You can think whatever you want of Napoleon, but he was really a good organizer. And when he set his mind to bringing art to Paris, he did it with an amazing uh, flair. Uh, 
he named uh, commissioners who were men who really knew what to look for. And these men uh, chose the best art, not only art actually, they chose manuscript, uh, botanical, uh, bo botanical etchings, they were whatever was of any importance. Now, not only did they choose well, but they were extraordinary organizers because you have to think of the extraordinary difficulty of transporting art of that quality uh, you know, fr from Italy to France. Think of a, of a painting like uh, The Wedding uh, at Cana of Veronese, the big masterpiece, 10 meters long, seven meters high. It had to be taken out of its frame, rolled with straw, placed in a huge tube, placed in a cart that was also lined with straw. And the cart had risen wheels so that uh, the, the bumpy roads wouldn't damage the, the canvas too much. Uh, the, uh, it was not drawn by, by jaunty horses, but by staid uh, buffaloes. Uh, and uh, it made its way to Genoa, and then from Genoa to Toulon by sea. It was easier to go by sea. And then from Toulon, it took the river up to Paris. And these uh, masterpieces uh, didn't make, uh, didn't make a discreet appearance in Paris. For instance, for the arrival of the Veronese, the government organized a huge parade. It was a parade that was preceded by wild animals, uh, camels, bears, lions. Then they showed the four copper horses that they had snatched from St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, and then carts and carts of paintings and sculptures. The smaller paintings were taken out of their crates and the soldiers carried them on their shoulders. So you can imagine that this built enthusiasm and interest in the public. I mean, suddenly art w was present, was uh, amazingly present, and everybody sort of participated in what was called the fete, the, the, the great party. Now, another reason for the rising interest in painting was that it became much easier for contemporary artists to show their works. Until the revolution, only artists that were members of the academy showed their art to the public twice a year in the Salon Carré du Louvre. That's why these exhibitions were called Salon. But the revolutionary government sort of opened the thing up and every, every artist was free to show. I mean, there was a jury, but still it was obviously much more open and the canvases <coughs> showed uh, went from a few hundred to a few thousand. And the salon were mobbed. People really came in throng and they stayed there for hours looking at all those paintings that really, uh, that covered the walls. There was a great interest. And a few years later, the Luxembourg, the Luxembourg Palace, you know, is a great palace in the Luxembourg Garden. It was built by Marie de Medici to house her collection. Well, during the revolution, it was transformed in what was called Le Musée des Artistes Vivants, the Museum of Living Artists. So that there was a jury, of course, but the jury selected living artists and their art was shown there for 10 years. After 10 years, if the art was deemed, uh, uh, deemed uh, valuable enough, it, if it had resisted the time, it was transferred to the Louvre and place was made for younger artists. If not, after 10 years, it was given back to the artist. But most of, we like to hope that most of it made it to the Louvre. Now, of course, having easy access to great works of art by visiting a museum seems so normal to us that we rarely think of the cultural revolution brought about the innovation. You know, before the revolution, only birthright or unusual personal success gave one the opportunity of 
entering a mansion or penetrating in a palace to see the collections. Otherwise, where did you see art? In churches, but as we all know, it's not very satisfactory because churches are very dark and we still, we still know, you know, you, you put the, the coins in a, little, uh, in a little contraption that lights up the thing for a few seconds. It's not very satisfactory. But suddenly, wandering at will and at one's own speed around the Louvre Grand Gallery was priceless, uh, both literally, because admittance was free, and uh, metaphorically. Now, this sort of public access was completely unprecedented in Europe. Uh, English aristocrats, German princes had always allowed visitors to see their collections, but obviously the vi visitors had to be recommended. It was, you couldn't just walk in. The National Gallery in London opened uh, 30 years after the Louvre opened, <coughs> but only with 38 paintings. Uh, the, the, Vienna, uh, the Vienna Imperial Palace had public rooms with very good paintings. But then again, it was soi-disant public. But still, for instance, in Vienna, the visitors had to have clean shoes, which may seem a bit bizarre, but it's interesting because if you had clean shoes, it proved that you could either aff afford a handsome cab or that you had a carriage. So it proved that you were rather up in the social scale. <coughs> well, at the Louvre, everybody came, you know, the, the populace came, soldiers came, much to the disgust, I have to say, of Prussian tourists who thought that you couldn't look at art with such a mob around you. <laughs> so frequent visits uh, to the Louvre gave, of course, a whole court of young writers a genuine knowledge <laughs> of painting. And uh, discovering contemporary artists gave writers a common language with painters. So they, they became to, to be quite close one to the other. And what is curious also is that the boundaries between the two arts uh, became less distinct. Um, for instance, uh, Victor Hugo or Théophile Gautier could have very well opted for painting or for drawing instead of literature. Um, the Goncourt brothers, for instance, started out as a watercolorist until they switched to literature. Because actually everybody thought that painting was much more difficult than writing, which may be or may be not true. Now, the opposite it, do, it doesn't quite work the other way, though you might say that somebody like Delacroix uh, wrote a, a marvelous journal, which is really a work of great literature. But Delacroix was a painter foremost. But think of somebody like Eugène Fromentin. Fromentin did both perfectly well, excellent painter, and he wrote a little gem of a novel called Dominique, which is still widely read in France and taught in schools. So there, there was this sort of a mix. And then there was also something very uh, particular to France, is that novelists, essayists, poets, all wrote art criticism. And they do, did it during the whole century. But every great uh, writer did. Uh, Hugo, uh, Stendhal, Gautier, Baudelaire, Zola, Mallarmé, they all took a lot of pains in writing their art columns. And then finally, attracted by very modest rents, bohemian artists, uh, young writers, uh, painters, musicians, lived in a, in a sort of dilapidated uh, neighborhood called the Doyenne, which is actually described very precisely by Balzac in his novel uh, La Cousine Bette, Cousin Betty. And uh, La, Le Doyenne was very close to the Louvre. And there they lived together what Théophile Gautier uh, called a sort of Robinson Crusoe existence. Think, you know, think of the opera La Bohème. You know, La Bohème, the, the libretto is based <coughs> on uh, the novel of a, write, of a French writer, Henri Murier. And what does it describe? It describes the interwoven life of a painter, a poet, um, a philosopher, and a musician. So actually, no wonder that this new 
fascination with art was going to mark novelists of the century. I would like to talk and contrast three great novelists, uh, Balzac, Zola, and Proust. The reason I am including Proust is that, as you all know, Proust was, was what they call an uh, in-between century writer, 19th century, 20th century. But he was born in 1871, so he really received a 19th century education. And his uh, fictional painter, Elstir's age and uh, preoccupation are really that of a 19th century artist. So let's start with Balzac. Balzac was 15 when he arrived in Paris in 1814. That's just one year before the defeat of Napoleon. After Napoleon's defeat, the Louvre had to give back part of its collection. But they didn't give it all back. They kept about half of it because it was so expensive to send back all those paintings. So actually, they kept quite a lot of things. Anyway, Balzac spent a lot of time at the Louvre, most of his free time, actually. And he acquired a remarkable knowledge of its collections. And it shows in its work. Think of the way he describes people. First, what is noteworthy is that Balzac is the first novelist to give a very precise physical description of his characters. You know, Think of Les Liaisons Dangereuses, the, the, great, the, the best known novel of the 18th century, of the preceding period. Well, Laclos, when he wants to describe Madame de Tourvel, his heroine, he just says she had a heavenly face. <laughs> if you go back a bit further in La Princesse de Clèves, well, La Princesse de Clèves, she was the most beautiful woman of the court. And that's it. But Balzac goes into the detail of the complexion, the hands, the hair. I mean, he, it's a very, very precise and evocative uh, description of a, a, a woman, a child, or a man. And sometimes, because Balzac was always in a hurry, he would take a, sh he would ha he would take a shortcut. And he would say, oh, it would take a painter to describe and he cites the name of a painter. And he does that all the time. And curiously, in Balzac, the women, when they are good, when they're good-natured, when they are kind, and when they have dark hair, they are always Raphaels. The ones that, who are mean, and generally the ones who are mean are blonde, they are associated to French <coughs> painters, notably uh, Giraudet. Somebody like uh, La Cousine Bette, you know, who's a frustrated spinster. Well, he says she could be a Cranach virgin, or perhaps even a Van Eyck. Old men uh, are most likely to recall Rembrandt's. And in some instances, uh, Balzac describes the painting uh, very, uh, very precisely. But sometimes he doesn't bother because he's so He's so confident in his conviction that his public will really know what he is talking about. Now, paintings often sowed the seeds for his novels. Baudelaire related an anecdote uh, circulating in Paris. One time, Balzac saw a beautiful painting, a very melancholy winter scene steeped in fog, dotted with shacks and scrawny peasants. He studied a little house and the thin trail of smoke coming out from it and cried, isn't it beautiful? But what do they do in that shack? What do they think about? What are their problems? Did they have a good harvest? <coughs> they probably have debts to pay. And from that, you can imagine the whole story taking place in his head. Actually, uh, more precisely, we know that two uh, very realistic paintings, one by Gros and one by Meunier, depicting uh, Napoleon on the battlefield of Elo. Elo was one of the bloodiest battles of the First Empire. And you see uh, Napoleon, in the, the two paintings are very similar. Napoleon is standing near a, um, a heap of bodies. 
And this was really uh, the uh, inspiration for, ba uh, for Balzac's novella, uh, Le Colonel Chabert. Le Colonel Chabert <coughs> is a, a colonel that is left for dead on the, on the battlefield, and he is buried under a heap of corpses. He's uh, left for dead, but he manages to claw his way out, and he is saved by peasants but it takes him 10 years to go back to Paris, to return to Paris, much to the chagrin of his wife, who has remarried. <laughs> now, uh, Balzac lived in a literary milieu and was not close friends with any painter. But what is curious is that he was much more interested in painters than in writers, much more interested in the career of a painter, <coughs> in their choice, in their reactions to the public. And he created 10 painters, all different, all interesting, and only one writer. And his writer is a very boring, virtuous man called Daniel D'Arthez. And you probably haven't heard about him because nobody Nobody really is interested by D'Arthez, but it's not true of his painters. And of his ten uh, paint, uh, characters, I think the one he prefers is Joseph Bridau, who is the hero of a novel called La Rabouilleuse. I think it's called The Black Sheep in the English translation. And he likes, um, he likes uh, Bridau, and he gave him many of his own traits his big head, his flashing head, <coughs> eyes, his unruly hair, his taste for Byron's poetry, for Géricault's painting, for Rossini's music, for Walter Scott's novel, and a mother who doesn't understand anything about him. <laughs> when, when Joseph, who is a, a, a true artist uh, and who does not want to compromise, announces to his mother that he plans to become a painter, she cries out, oh, I'm lost. Joseph, whom I wanted to be an employee at the Ministry of the Interior, wants to be a painter. He'll end up a barefoot beggar. Now, to give you an example of the variety of uh, Balzac's uh, painters, uh, painters, I will just give you two extremes. On one hand, you have Pierre Grassou, who's a tenacious craftsman, lacking any imagination, and extraordinarily uh, reassuring for a conservative, ignorant public and who ends up gaining quite a reputation in bourgeois circles where Balzac claims the main reason for choosing a particular artist is you can say what you like about him, but he puts 20,000 francs aside a year with his notaire. Now, at the other extreme, you have a genius called Frenhofer, and Frenhofer is uh, the hero of a novella called The Unknown Masterpiece. And Frenhofer is a painter whose conce conception of art is completely revolutionary, and he is misunderstood by everybody, <coughs> including his colleagues. And finally, uh, despaired by his friends and colleagues' refusal to admit that, as he says, reality and art are not interchangeable, Frenhofer commits suicide. Now, what is amazing in the story is the imaginative leap that Balzac takes. The implication that Balzac predicted the evolution of modern art is absolutely irresistible. When his friend Hofer claims that in nature there are no outlines, Balzac seemed to be anticipating the Impressionists by 30 years. And it is true that he even goes further because Frenhofer not only paints a bit like an Impressionist, but his last painting is a sort of, is, it's a wall of paint, he says, a mist of colors and hues from which emerges a foot, a delightful foot. And he t tells his, his colleague who came to see it, but don't, and his colleague in the novella is a real, a, a real painter. It's Nicolas Poussin, because he mixes the fictional with the, the real painter. And Frenhofer tells Poussin, but don't you see this woman? Of course, she's not a creature, she's a creation. <laughs> 
but even Poussin doesn't understand. Now, many years after the publication of the novella, painters have uh, identified with the character. And when the painter Émile Bernard read aloud the novella to Cézanne, he says that the painter got up, planted himself in front of me, and striking his chest with his index finger, indicated without a word, but through this repeated gesture, that he was the very person in the story. And in a later interview, uh, Cézanne also described how his eyes became so riveted by a painting he was trying to finish that he felt they might start bleeding. And he said, surely I'm slightly crazy, fixated on my painting like Frenhofer. And even later, Picasso, who illustrated the story, was absolutely thrilled when he realized that he was going, that he was going to move into a studio that was uh, located Neuf Quai des Grands Augustins, which was precisely the place where Frenhofer's story was set. So Picasso thought the coincidence was absolutely miraculous. Now, Zola is a completely different writer when it comes to art. The big difference with Balzac is that Zola always lived among painters and had done so since childhood. His best friend in school was Cézanne, and they remained friends all their life. Zola had difficult beginnings, uh, he was poor, it took him several years before he found an interesting job at a publishing house and started writing for newspapers, while Cézanne, for his part, who was supported by his banker father, could launch immediately into a painter's life. And it is Cézanne who introduced uh, Zola first uh, to Pissarro, uh, then uh, to Renoir, to Bazy, a very good painter who was unfortunately killed uh, during the first days of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, and then Manet, who was going to have a huge importance uh, for uh, Zola. And Zola remembered later, I mingled <coughs> with a whole group of young artists, Fontaine Latour, Degas, Renoir, Guillaume, and still others, Yesterday, I went to the 1866 Salon with Manet, Monet, and Pissarro, whose paintings have been harshly rejected. And he added, I'm surrounded by nothing but painters. I have not a single literary man with whom to talk. So the Impressionists adopted Zola, and Zola rewarded them by defending them with the utmost energy and talent when they were attacked and mocked by the conservative public. But what of the influence of his friends on his work? Well, he acknowledged his debt quite readily. He said, I have not only supported the Impressionists, I have translated them into literature. And the first thing that strikes me are the shared subjects. Zola themes owe a great deal to his painter's friends. You know, the waterside cafe, uh, the obsession with the Seine, the crowds on the boulevard, and of course, you have the case of Nana. Nana is a very interesting example of this sort of va-et-vient between the painter and the writer. You have here uh, the very famous Manet portrait entitled Nana. Well, Manet owed the name of his model and her occupation, you have no doubt, when you look at the gentleman at the edge of the canvas, looking rather hungrily at the back of the young girl. Well, he owed Nana to Zola, who invented him, for, who invented her as a vicious little girl, absolutely determined to live by her looks, in uh, L'Assommoir, the drinking den. But Manet does his, his, um, does his uh, painting, and then three years later, uh, Zola will finish the story in a novel precisely called Nana, where he recalls the, the rise and fall of the courtesan. So here you have an extraordinary mix. <coughs> You have also uh, something interesting with uh, Degas. Here is Degas' painting entitled uh, the, I the Ironers, Les Repasseuses. 
Well, Zola wrote to Degas saying, you know, I wrote my pages on the ironers, again in the drinking den, while I was looking at your painting. And you see, I find it, I find it quite curious because sort of traditionally, you would think that the Degas is an illustration of the Zola novel, but things had in a way switched and it was Zola who had, who had been inspired by uh, Degas. And it's also worth noting that even with, in details, uh, Zola and his painter's friends were interested in the same things. Think, for instance, of the fascination of Impressionists with mirror. Well, Zola was quite interested in mirrors also. Here you have Manet, uh, the bar at the Folie Berger, where the whole background is actually a mirror and it doubles the, the, it doubles the, the painting in a way. Well, Zola had, did exactly the same thing in his novel called uh, The Belly of Paris, Le Ventre de Paris. But it's not a bar, it's a charcuterie, it's a butcher shop that is lined with mirrors who, and the mirrors reflect sort of ad infinitum uh, uh, sausages <coughs> and, <laughs> and uh, chops and roasts. Uh, he did it the same thing in his novel on a department store, The Lady's Paradise. And there he took his inspiration from somebody, for instance, like uh, Morisot. Uh, uh, this is Degas, of course, Degas had mirrors all around uh, his paintings, his ballet paintings. And, but you have Morisot, and you see Morisot shows in the, you have the young girl looking at herself, but the reflection is a sort of fragmented image of her body. And Zola used the same thing. He describes the clients, the women, sort of fighting their way through the department store. And uh, he says uh, you, you, you could only see half shoulders and arms in the mirrors that, show, that showed uh, the merchandise. Uh, now, Zola's uh, work uh, really uh, bathes in uh, Impressionism. But what about his fictional painter? Unlike Balzac, he only created one painter, uh, Claude Lantier, and that got him into trouble. You might say that Balzac had the advantage of not knowing any painters, so his characters were truly invented. And Zola had all his models around him, so he could not free himself from his knowledge. His painter, Claude Lantier, has a lot of Cézanne. A Claude Lantier, they have the same uh, uh, physical, uh, they have the same physique, they have the same way of dressing, they have the same temper. Uh, he gave Lantier the impatience of Cézanne, his gruff manner, his attitude towards women. Now, Lantier, the fictional painter, does not paint like Cézanne. All his paintings resemble uh, more uh, creations by Manet, Monet, or Gustave Moreau. And Zola certainly did not intend to represent precisely Cézanne or anyone else, actually. His concern was about the torture of creation he himself endured and ultimately the self-destruction of the artist. Uh, Cézanne didn't, certainly did not self-destruct. But however, the novel was not well received by his friends, by his painter friends. Uh, nobody likes to be represented in a novel if it's not uh, absolutely uh, adulatory and if the character is not wholly successful. And Monet appointed himself the representative of his colleagues and wrote to Zola. And he wrote, I'm left feeling disturbed, anxious. I'm afraid that the enemies in the press and the general public will mention Manet or at least name us a group, name us as a group to make us look like losers. It's a bit ironic that Zola, who defended the Impressionists with such verve and energy, was misunderstood by, in that way by, by his friends. But very soon he threw himself in another battle. It was the time of the Dreyfus Affair in France. And so he did not pursue discussions uh, on the masterpiece. 
you know, the affair uh, split France in two. Uh, of course, uh, it also split uh, the artistic milieu, and uh, Cézanne, uh, Renoir, Degas were fiercely anti-Dreyfusist, uh, while uh, Pissarro and Monet were the only ones that sided with Zola in defense of Dreyfus. But so the easy familiarity that had brought them all together evaporated, but uh, happily uh, the works uh, remain. Now, of course, Proust I is another, whoop, my, my computer has disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Proust is another. Uh, is another. Uh, is another. Has another point of view altogether. He was of a generation that no longer shared uh, the concerns of his elders, uh, Zola and Maupassant, who so passionately defended the painting of their time. Proust actually was never tempted to take sides in the various controversies that shook the art world. And if art has something of a privileged place in his novel, it is for quite different reasons. Like all the novelists I have mentioned, freq uh, Proust, frequently, Proust frequented the Louvre very assiduously, and his <laughs> knowledge of classical art was quite remarkable. But he was not at all familiar with contemporary painting. He had never seen a Cezanne, for instance. Where can they be seen, he asked his friend and portraitist, Jacques-Emile Blanche. He had, no, had never seen a Matisse or a Bonnard. He didn't seem very interested by Picasso or Braque. So it is not surprising that the references and preoccupations of his fictional painter and steer were definitely connected to the 19th century. Now, Proust is not a realist novelist in the vein of Balzac or Zola, and his painter is never shown actually working. He's never shown uh, worrying about his work. He's never shown worrying about uh, the reception of his work by the public or the presence or absence of clients. He is a completely uh, intellectual uh, creation, and he is interesting and um, and uh, very interesting in the novel for another reason. Uh, Proust created three characters that were, who were artists. He had a musician, a Vinteuil, a writer, Bergotte, and a painter, Elstir. And it is Elstir that, is, that introduces the narrator to the world of art. He teaches him how to look at things. The most, it really shows him that he has to look with what he called a virgin eye. So it is not the, it is a completely a different, uh, a different preoccupation than uh, Balzac or Zola. But however, he does use real paintings in his work. All the readers of Proust know that Swan, the esthete, falls in love with a courtesan, Odette, when he sees in her a resemblance with a Botticelli. Once he imagines her as a Botticelli, uh, she, he falls in love with her. <coughs> and he sees her as a priceless masterpiece, cast just that one time in some different, especially charming material, creating the rarest of pieces that he contemplated sometimes with the humility, spirituality, and selflessness of an artist sometimes with the pride, egotism, and sensuality of a collector. But she does not remain a Botticelli forever. She turns cold, grasping, and pretty soon the Botticelli is going to be turned into Gustave Moreau's Salome. I don't know if you have her in mind, but Salome is this sort of terrifying, beautiful, bejeweled creature holding the, the head of St. John the Baptist. But I would like to conclude on a more paradoxical topic, just to show that it's rather diffi difficult to maintain a thesis sometimes. Proust, as I said, was not interested in contemporary art. You have to remember that he actually rarely uh, went out during the day, during the last years of his life. Uh, the famous visit to the Vermeer exhibit uh, 
required a lot of advanced planning and didn't end well. So he did, he did know Picasso because he had gone to the Ballet Russe, you know, and Picasso had made the sets of certain ballets and he was very, and uh, Proust was interested in the ballet because his friend Rinaldo Ahn had, done, had uh, composed the music. And also Proust thought that Picasso was really perhaps the most handsome man he had ever seen. <laughs> but when he was brought to Picasso's studio by the young avant-garde poet Jean Cocteau, he was not very impressed. He came back and he told uh, Celeste, his housekeeper, you know, I went to see the Spanish painter. He's turned to something called Cubism. I have to admit that I didn't really understand it. And it's an interesting statement, given the number of cubist elements that in his own style. Now, the first person who noticed that was his publisher, Jacques Rivière. Jacques Rivière wrote, for example, wrote to him in a letter, for example, one thing that struck me for the first time is your relationship with the cubist movement, and more fundamentally, your profound immersion in contemporary aesthetic reality. Never have the same statements been presented from so many angles, to the point, no doubt, that they seem to lose all meaning, and would lose all meaning, if the movement and ceaseless continuation of your narration didn't ensure their restoration. Now, his friend, uh, Fernand Gregg, was saying the same thing, but in more uh, familiar terms, when he commented, at 20, Marcel looked on life the same way a fly does, with a multifaceted eye. He saw polygonally, he saw all 20 sides of a question and added a 21st, which was <coughs> prodigiously inventive and ingenious. Of course, one thinks of these comments when reading this passage of uh, In Search of Lost Time on the elusive Albertine. You know, the narrator is in love with Albertine but can never quite figure her out. And he looks at Albertine and what he says immediately conjures a Picasso painting. How much more strange it is for a woman to be joined as Rosita and Dulcica, they were two Siamese twins, to an, uh, or to another woman whose different type of beauty produces another personality, and to see one, you have to view her in profile, and the other full in the face. Mm. <laughs> now, not having studied or even looked at Cubist works, Proust was not influenced by them. Neither were the Cubists influenced by Proust. They sort of passed each other. But whereas there are justifiable analogies to be found between the Impressionists and writers who were their contemporaries, the same cannot be found in the case of Proust and the Cubist movement. But there is no escaping the striking coincidence in their vision operating through the fragmentation and recomposition of images. In 1925, when Virginia Woolf was immersed in reading Proust, she wrote, were all modern paintings to be destroyed, a critic of the 25th century would be able to deduce from the works of Proust alone the existence of Matisse, Cézanne, Dorin, and Picasso. He would be able to say, with these books before him, that painters with the highest originality and power must be covering canvas after canvas, squeezing tubes after tubes in the room next door. Painting and literature had been inextricably linked for over a century, and Virginia's Woolf enthusiasm may have been a little excessive, but she did see things as they were. And I think her observation on Proust could have been made apropos of each of the writers I have discussed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.